Uh, the other night, we were at home finishing off dinner, and all of a sudden, the doorbell rang, and there was a knock on the door. Now, I'm always the type of person who thinks, why do you need to do both? I mean, can't you just ring the doorbell or knock on the door, but you have to do both. And so, you know, I'm already a little bit agitated of like, all right, whatever, UPS or Amazon or whoever it is. So I go and I open up the front door and there stands a solicitor wanting to talk to me about pest control. Now, I have to tell you something before I go any further with this story, and that is that both my wife and my son were within 15 feet of the open door when this guy wanted to start talking to me about pest control. Are you interested in pest control, goes the question. My response, no, I am not interested. Then he says, well, why not? And I say, well, because we are already using a certain pest control. Well, who is that pest control company that you are using? My response is, I'm very happy and satisfied with who I'm using. Thank you. And I shut the door on his face. (laughs) Don't applaud because there's a bad part coming here. So I walk in feeling rather victorious about what a great move I have made of pushing the person away. And my 20-year-old son says to me, well, that was kind of (laughs) rude. Now, when a 20-year-old boy says anything about something being rude, you have to kind of pay attention because there is no, I mean, he does not know, understand the meaning of rudeness, right? At age 20 as a guy, like he, he doesn't get that. And I'm like, That was not rude. I was simply getting rid of him. I have no need for more pest control service. And then my wife chimes in. Well, you know, he's just trying to make a living. To which I have a number of other good excuses. Not during dinner time, not ringing the doorbell, knocking at the exact same time. And then my wife throws the dagger, right? Well, I hope he doesn't figure out you're a pastor. <laughs> oh, yeah, right? Like, if only I was Catholic so I could go to confessional, right, and say some Hail Marys, full of grace, get some rosary beads out or something like that. I'm like, seriously, you have to go there. Now, the irony is this. That for the whole week leading up to this conversation I had, or a very short conversation I had with this young guy, I'd been working on this sermon series of talking about the implications of being made in the image of God. What does it mean to be made in God's image? What are the implications of how we understand our relationship with God, how we understand our relationship with creation? And how we understand our relationship with one another. Do we treat one another as God's anointed? And I was totally convicted at that moment of, wow, you can work on this the whole week and then you can be completely rude. Just like that. Now, that wasn't the worst thing. The next morning, I'm out for a walk on the beach kind of working through my sermon, and I have this, it wasn't a voice, it was probably my conscience, this idea of saying, what would it look like if God treated you like you treated that guy at your front door? You go to God with a request for something, and God opens the door and says, I'm not interested, shuts the door. I'm like, dang it, Lord, why do you have to do stuff like that to me? You know, because you kind of think you're like making your way and you're getting better at things and you're treating people better and all this sort of stuff. And then it just all comes crashing down. And God teaches us and shows us how often we fall short. How often we fall short of the glory of God. But I want us to go back to the very beginning, to Genesis 1. And I promise we're getting to Deuteronomy 8 in just a minute. We're going to get to my text, I promise you. But all of Genesis 1 leads up to this glorious moment. 
God is creating. God is working. God is resting. God is enjoying his creation. He's looking and he's seeing that it is good. And then we get to the creation of humankind. Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. All of this leads up to this glorious day, the sixth day, when God, out of his great delight, creates you and me in his own image. And then he gives us homework, right? Like we're the only, we're the only part of all of creation that has a homework assignment. Be fruitful, multiply, tend, steward, care. We'll talk about this a little bit later in the sermon series. But this idea of saying that somehow you and I bear the image of God. We reflect something of God to the created world and the created order. I love how N.T. Wright puts this. He says, here, here's, here is our task. Our task as image-bearing, God-loving, Christ-shaped, spirit-filled Christians following Christ and shaping our world is this, is to announce redemption to a world that has discovered its fallenness, to announce healing to a world that has discovered its brokenness, to proclaim love and trust to a world that knows only exploitation, fear, and suspicion. N.T. Wright says this. I mean, I, I really thought I was like, if I was a really nice preacher, I would have told the opening story. I would have you take a picture of this on your phone and say, go out and live it, right? Now, you know I'm not that nice because I got a lot of other things I need to say this morning. But N.T. Wright, I think, really gets at it. Saying this is what it looks like to be made in the image of God. There is this relationship back to God. There is this relationship to creation. There is this relationship to the created order and to one another. But there's a problem. And I'm a living example of that problem. We tend to forget that we are made in the image of God. We tend to begin to live for ourselves and not put God first. And so our text this morning, Deuteronomy chapter 8, is actually kind of a sermon that comes as a warning to Israel. Moses is preaching. I mean, if you look through Deuteronomy, it's basically a bunch of sermons that Moses gives right before the people enter the promised land. And so this is what he says as they're standing on the verge of the promised land. Verse 10, Deuteronomy 8. When you have eaten and are satisfied, praise the Lord your God for the good land he has given you. Be careful that you do not forget the Lord your God failing to observe his commands, his laws, and his decrees that I am giving you this day. Otherwise, when you eat and are satisfied, when you build fine houses and settle down, and when your herds and flocks grow large and your silver and gold increase and all you have is multiplied, then your heart will become proud and you will forget the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt out of the land of slavery. He led you through the vast and dreadful wilderness, that thirsty and waterless land with its venomous snakes and scorpions. He brought you water out of hard rock. He gave you manna to eat in the wilderness, something your ancestors had never known, to humble and test you so that in the end it might go well with you. You may say to yourself, My power and the strength of my hands have produced this wealth for me. But remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth and so confirms his covenant, which he swore to your ancestors as it is today. Moses looks at the nation of Israel. Moses knows he is not going into the promised land. He is not going to lead them in. Joshua is going to lead them in. And he says, you need to be very careful because here's what's going to happen. The Lord has blessed you. 
The Lord has brought you this far. The Lord will take you into the promised land. And remember, the promised land for Israel, it, it harkens back to the, to the day of creation before the fall. Like it, it is this place of wonder and this place of joy. And Moses says, here's what's going to happen. You're going to get into the promised land. And you are going to prosper. And things are going to go well for you. And do you know what you're going to do? You're going to say, look at how awesome and amazing I am. Right? Because I've worked hard for all of this. I've created this legacy. I've created this empire. I've created my own little kingdom. And I am so good. And I am so talented. And it becomes all about me and my giftedness. And Moses says, you're going to forget about the mercy of God. Be very careful. And I think for those of us living in this Western world of ours, the danger is just as real, if not more real. Because we're taught to pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps. We're told if we work hard, we will prosper. And then when we prosper, we look back and say, man, I am so amazing. Look at what I have done. And Moses and God say, you better be very careful. Do not forget about the generous nature of the God who created you, of the God who gave you life. So we know how that story goes, right? Israel does make it in. They do begin to prosper. They do begin to think it's all about themselves. They do forget about the widows and the orphans and all this story. You all know this story very well. We all seem to have spiritual amnesia, right? How many times does the story have to be told before we get it? Well, you know, I always think when I preach, it's fun to bring out texts that most of us probably, perhaps we've read, But we've probably never heard a sermon on or spent a lot of time on it. So as I was working through this sermon this morning, or for this morning, I remembered Haggai. Y'all remember good old Haggai, right? Prophesied during the days of Darius. So Darius, we just talked about Darius a couple weeks ago, right? Because he was ruling right at the time of Daniel. So this prophet named Haggai comes comes to start preaching and teaching while the people of Israel are somewhat prospering, but also now being able to return to Jerusalem to build the temple. Now, you know, being a prophet's always rough because God, like, never... Um, you know, God oftentimes, I've noticed this with prophets, there's no softening of the voice, right? It's just like, here you go. So here's what's happening. Darius has come to power. God's people, some of them are considering going back to Jerusalem, helping to rebuild the temple. But Jerusalem is the pits, right? They're living, they've prospered now in the land of Babylon and now the land of Persia. And, and who wants to go back to that, to a, you know, a temple that's been grounded and taken, been wiped out, to the walls that have been torn down? So this is what we read in Haggai chapter 1, verse 2. This is what the Lord Almighty says. These people say, okay, now we're talking about Israel. The time has not yet come to rebuild the Lord's house. Then the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. Is it a time for you yourselves, and this is the conviction, to be living in your paneled houses while this house remains a ruin? Now this is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. You have planted much but harvested little. You eat but never have enough. You drink but never have your fill. You put on clothes but are not warm. You earn wages only to put them in a purse with holes in it. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. Go up to to the mountains and bring down timber and build my house so that I may take pleasure in it and be honored, says the Lord. You expected much, but see, it turned out to be little. What you brought home, I blew away. Why, declares the Lord? Because of my house, which remains a ruin, while each of you is busy with your own house. Hmm. Well, that's a rather convicting verse. Whose house are we busy with? 
whose glory are we really concerned about? Who are we really celebrating? Moses says, be very careful. Haggai comes along and says, you know what? You still haven't learned. You haven't prioritized. You're building your own paneled houses while the Lord's house sits in ruins. And man, I cannot tell you how badly I want to preach a stewardship sermon right now. But I'm not going to do that. But I do want us to think about generosity. Because that's part of what is being driven at here. Here's the dilemma that you and I have. When it comes to our faith. We come in and we hear the word of God. We hear music sung. We sing our hymns. We pray and we get focused. And then we walk out into this world. And we immediately begin to drift. A couple months ago, our family uh, was out in, in Maui. And um, we love to go snorkeling when we go to, to, to Hawaii. And so we kind of went off and, you know, it was a little bit choppy. So we, we swam out a little bit further and we're just, you know, looking for turtles and looking for fish and, and doing all that sort of fun stuff that you get to do when you're, when you're in Maui. And, and we'd probably been out there like 10 or 15 minutes. And all of a sudden I looked up and I was like, we're like 150 feet from where we went into the water. Right? Not 150 feet away from the shore, but 150 feet down, right, from where we actually entered the water. And, and most of you all have probably experienced this. It's like we got caught. It wasn't like a rip current or rip tide. It wasn't anything like that. But there's just this current of water, and we're not paying attention, and we're swimming, and we're chasing after fish and turtles and, and all this sort of, sort of stuff. And all of a sudden, we've just, like, drifted 150 feet down the ocean, down the beach. And this is what happens to us in our faith. We get out there, we're doing our thing, and somehow we get caught up in this current that just moves us further and further and further away from things of the kingdom. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 1 puts it like this. We must pay the most careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard so that we do not drift away. The preacher of Hebrews says, you have to pay attention. Moses says, you have to pay attention. Because we're going to get pulled away. We're going to drift. We're going to forget what it means literally to be made in the image of God. And man, I don't like that. And that's why I love Colossians chapter 1, verse 15 through 17. Because Paul, the Apostle Paul, uses the same image to talk about this image of God, but he uses Jesus. And this is what we read. The Son, Jesus Christ, this is verse 15, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. The Son, Jesus Christ, is the image of the invisible God. When we want to discern fully what it means to be made in the image of God, the Apostle Paul says you look to Jesus. This is the advantage that you and I have of the people who lived before Jesus. We now know how to turn our attention and where to turn our attention. We have someone that we get to look to, the one who is the image of the invisible God, the one who has come to reconcile, to make things right, so that one day when the Lord returns and we are all called up, that, that we will have these fully restored, fully reconciled bodies. That God is in the work of transformation. That the way in which we celebrate the creator, the way in which we honor our living God, is we seek to look to him through Jesus, the one who is the image of the invisible God. This is our hope. 
He is the one who rescues us. Three hundred and fifty years ago or so, the Westminster Shorter Catechism was written. The very first question of the Westminster Shorter Catechism is that I'd ask you to yell it out loud, but you might not know it, so I'm gonna I'm gonna let you I'm gonna let you off on this one. Here's the question. Put it up on the screen. What is I'm not going to tell you the answer to this yet, okay? What is the chief end of humankind? You remember catechisms? These are the way in which they taught people the faith. The Westminster Shorter Catechism has like 150 questions or 160 questions or something like that. When I was in seminary, I think they still do this. There was some foundation that had created a thing saying, hey, if you can, if you can answer every question that Westminster Shorter Catechism will give you a $750 scholarship for school. I was like, that is a bad investment of my time right there, right? 150 answers for 750 bucks. I did the math on that. And I was like, no, thank you. I would rather take the debt than, than, than figure that out. But I do know the answer to the first question. How many of you all remember what the answer to this question is? All right. So here's how the writers of the Westminster Shorter Catechism answered it. What is the chief end of humankind? To glorify God and to enjoy him forever. What is our aim? I love that question. I was talking to Shannon this morning and I was like, I said, I love the, I said, I, I, she's like, how's the sermon? Which she always asks me every morning how the sermon is. And I'm always like, that's fine. You know, it's because I, I never know how it is until I actually get up and deliver it. Right. I mean, it's just like, it could fall flat on the face. It could be great. It could be anywhere in between there. And so my answer is always like, oh, it's just fine. It's fine. But I said, the problem is this is I'm like, I said, I'm looking for this. Like, how do I, how do I say that, you know, like, what's the illustration of glorifying God and enjoying him forever? I said, that, that's the. You know, and, and Shannon's like, I love that. She said, I love that because it's like my anchor. Like when life is a struggle, I think about that first question of the Westminster Shorter Catechism. And it's my anchor. I was like, that is great. It's so nice, like when you're on the same wavelength, and this happens probably for, you know, what happens. It's like, I said, that's awesome because I'm talking about drifting away in our faith, right? And if you've got this anchor, To glorify God and enjoy him forever. Psalm chapter 8. I just want to give you a couple of of scriptures to go with this, just because I think it, it always is helpful. Here's what the psalmist says. This is David's psalm. I think we looked at this earlier this year as he talks about what it, what it means to, to, you know, to know that God is mindful of us. And this is verse 5. As he's describing you and me. You have made them, you've made us a little lower than the angels and crowned us, crowned them with glory and honor. You made them rulers over the works of your hands. You put everything under their feet, all flocks and herds, all the animals of the wild, the birds in the sky, the fish in the sea, all that swim the paths of the sea. And then he says, O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You've crowned us with glory. My gosh. Do you know how amazing that is? We're the only ones of all of God's creation that bear his glory. And the Westminster Shorter Catechism says, return that glory to God. Worship God in his fullness. Sing your praises Pray to the living God and glorify his name. And then enjoy him forever. The great benediction of Numbers chapter 6, verses 24 through 27. This to me is the enjoyment piece. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you his peace. 
So they will put my name on the Israelites, and I will bless them. You see, it's not only just about the glorifying of God, it's the enjoying. It's the crazy reality that you and I get to walk out of this place, and literally in five minutes, we can be at the beach, at the ocean. And we can behold the wonder of God, the beauty of God. To enjoy God is to sit there and to consider, what has God done for me in Jesus Christ? It's back to Colossians chapter 1, verse 15. God has loved me so much that in spite of my sinfulness, in spite of my brokenness, in spite of my rudeness, my personal rudeness, not yours, um, God still loves me. And I can relish in that. And I can cherish that. And I can find enjoyment in that. To glorify God and enjoy him forever. That is our anchor. Okay, wrapping up. Here we go. Ralph Waldo Emerson says this. What we are worshiping, we are becoming. Whatever you worship, whatever gets your allegiance, whatever gets your time, whatever gets your resources, whatever you get your priorities, Emerson says, that's what you will become. And so I want us to think about that. And maybe you don't buy that. I I personally buy it, but maybe you don't buy that. But whatever gets the best of us is in a sense what it is or who it is that we are going to become. And the story of Scripture is saying, give God your very best. Do not hold back. God has been so generous, so loving, so merciful. And our calling is simply to respond back to him in faithfulness. To cherish him. To honor him. To glorify him and enjoy him forever. Pray with me, please. God, we know that we fall short. We know that perhaps even today we have not lived faithfully and fully for you. And Lord, it's not about shame. But it's about grace and seeing how you in the midst of all of that love us and cherish us. Lord, our problem is one that has existed from generation to generation to generation. We have this tendency to drift. Sometimes we don't even realize it's happened. And yet you still love us. Because God, we're created in your image. And when we live for others, when we live for other things, we break down that image. And so you call us to look to Jesus. The image of the invisible God. So God, cleanse us from where we have gone astray. Set us right on the path. And Lord, may we live a life where we glorify and enjoy you forever. We pray in Jesus' name.